Welcome back to The World Over. When my next guest was just 18, she spent three weeks in Uganda during her senior year in high school. Little did she know the trip would change her life forever. After returning home to Tennessee, she decided to postpone college and move to Uganda to teach at an orphanage for girls. Her year-long commitment turned into a lifelong calling. I sat down with her recently to discuss her work and her new book, Daring to Hope, Finding God in the Broken and the Beautiful. Here's my interview with Katie Davis Majors. Katie, you make a decision to forego college. You, you, you go to Uganda. Why would you do that? I had been to Uganda on a short-term trip my senior year in high school, and I had been invited by a pastor there to come back and volunteer at his orphanage for a year. Mm. So after finishing high school, I decided just to defer college for a year and move to Uganda and spend that year volunteering. While I was there, though, I, I saw a lot of things that were very shocking to me. Immense poverty, for sure. But also, I found out that about 80% of children in Uganda who are living in institutions or orphanages mm -hmm. actually have at least one living parent. And so in Uganda, most orphanages are filled with children who are not unloved or unwanted, but are just very poor. Wow. And it's a way for them to eat. It's a way yeah, they be cared for Yeah, their for parents to send them there so that they will be well taken care of, mm. so that someone will pay for them to go to school. School mm. is a huge cost to Ugandan mm. families. And I just, I wanted to do something to change that. And so I began asking community members that I had made friends with, if I would help pay for your children to go to school, maybe help with some food around the house, some of these basic costs, would you then want to keep your children? And unanimously, people said yes. Mm. So I began to send a couple of children from the community to school, paying mm. for their school fees with some of the support I had raised to live there. Mm. I began to share with my parents and some friends from back home what was going on and what I was seeing. And people said, oh, I could, I could give you some money to do that. I could help out mm. in that way. And before you know it, I was sending 40 kids from the local community huh. to school <laughs> yeah. and was developing relationships with them, teaching their parents about the Bible. And I thought, oh, I should probably give this a name. <laughs> yeah, and it was Amazima, Amazima Ministries. Yes. Yeah. And you, you found that in 2008, by the time you're 23 years old, you have 13 foster daughters. Yes. How did you, how did you go from helping these kids and trying to reconnect them with their families and get them food and schooling to actually fostering and then adopting 13 daughters? Yeah. So Amazima continued to grow, and we had 40, and then 60, and then 100 children, and we expanded until we have about 600 children today that we're sponsoring. Mm. And uh, over the course of that time, there were children that I was in relationship with through the ministry that, for various tragic reasons, didn't actually have a family member that they could stay with. Maybe they had lost all their living relatives. Maybe their living relatives were dangerous. And so... Um, our children are five sibling groups mm. that all came to me and all of them, their situations were difficult. And so I said, oh, well, you can stay here for a little while while we look and while we investigate the situation. And we've had lots and lots and lots of kids come through our home in that way mm. over the years. But for these 13, we were never able to find a safer, viable option for them to go back mm. into the community. And so I did begin the process to foster them long term, which eventually led to finalizing their adoptions. Wow. Now, yeah. you write in Daring to Hope in your new book that uh, you don't always get the ending mm. that you imagined or that you hoped for. What did you hope for? Because this was not an easy, this was not an easy thing. Adopting these these thirteen girls and building this ministry, there are a lot of challenges. What did you hope for? What did you find? Yeah, um, there are several stories in Daring to Hope that that I share of of personally what I felt like were kind of unanswered prayers. We also mm -hmm. get the privilege of caring for a lot of hurting people in our mm -hmm. home, whether that's somebody who's in between jobs and, and homeless for a season. Maybe that's somebody who's very, very ill and needs mm. consistent access to the hospital, which our house is situated close to the local hospital. And so as we've cared for these people, we've prayed a lot of things for them. You know, we've prayed healing over them and we've prayed restoration. And sometimes God has granted that. And we've yeah. been able to see these people onto a joyful new part of their future. 
sometimes we have prayed and asked for those things and they haven't come. I have, I have prayed for people to be healed and they have still died and gone on to eternity with Jesus. And so I think that really started for me this process of wrestling with Okay, God, I've always believed that you are a good and loving and faithful mm-hmm. God, but how could you be loving when suffering is so present in the world? And so I feel like I saw that my hope was maybe not true hope. Maybe it was more of kind of a naive optimism mm-hmm. where I was looking for just a happy ending or just things to go to go the way that I wanted them to go. And instead, God has showed me that true hope is looking to him no matter what the situation is and trusting and believing that he might not give us what we're asking for, but he is going to give us what we need. Mm -hmm. And he is going to be present with us to get us through all circumstances. But it was a personal crisis of faith. I mean, there are moments in here where you really struggle. Absolutely. Um, Particularly, it was a situation about uh, one of the, the daughters that you were trying to adopt, and you lose her. Yes. Tell me about that situation and what it brought you to appreciate. Yeah. I, like I mentioned, we had fostered children temporarily right. very often with the hopes of placing them back in their families, and mm-hmm. that's something that our ministry is really geared toward. But with Jane, we had she had been abandoned when she was a baby and had been brought to me. Mm-hmm. We had advertised in the newspaper and on the radio trying to find family for her, and no one had come forward. So I had begun the long-term foster care process and was almost done with the three years required by Uganda before you can finalize an adoption. Adoption. Mm. And just toward the end of that three years, when our paperwork was almost final, her biological mom came forward and expressed a desire to parent Jane. And mm. so, of course, that wasn't that wasn't what we had been expecting. I hadn't ever gone through in my mind the, the thought of resettlement with her. And so it was devastating to me and even mm. to her sisters, to, to my other girls. We were devastated by the loss of this child from our family. And I I feel like I really got to experience God's presence and Mm -hmm. his peace, even in the midst of that very, very difficult hardship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2015, you marry. Yes. You're a special guy. Yeah. I mean, did you ever think you'd meet somebody who would welcome a a pre-made family this large, 13 girls and a wife? You know, I didn't. That was kind of a dream that I thought, oh. Well, it would be nice to be married, but, but I guess maybe it's not in the cards for me. Yeah, and he's a, a missionary. Yes, as well. Yeah. Oh, so that worked out well. Yeah. And now you have two more. Just one more. Just one more. Yeah. So it's fourteen now. Fourteen now. Oh. So we had we had our son about a year and a half ago now. What has been your impact not only on the volunteers because it seems they're very open to adopting, but Ugandan culture did not. It is not a culture that necessarily was open to adoption. It's really just not in the, in, the, in the culture. Have you changed things at all or seen an impact? Yeah, I really think we have. I think the Ugandan culture is very gracious and very hospitable by nature, but poverty makes it very hard mm. to welcome other children into your home. And so um, it is in the culture to welcome people in, but people find it very hard. And, and the word adoption isn't really a term that is used, but um, we've had about seven staff members, Ugandan staff members mm-hmm. that are working for Amazima, our ministry organization, who have adopted and fostered children from the community. And people ask me now sometimes, well, do you think you'll ever adopt again? And I, I mean, I always say we would be open to it if we felt like the Lord made it very clear, mm-hmm. but we have seen an uprising of Ugandan people in our community who are open to fostering and who are open to adoption. And so mm-hmm. The last many children who I have fostered who we haven't been able to find um, a biological family placement for have actually gone on to be fostered by Ugandan community members. Katie, so many people that will read this book, they'll never go to Uganda. They'll really never understand the poverty or the hardship Mm -hmm. in many cases that you're dealing with and that you deal with on a daily basis. Why did you want them to understand this story? And what do you hope they'll take from it and incorporate into their own lives? I really hope it's it's a relatable story because, yeah, your life might not look the same as mine. I, I live in Uganda. I have a huge family. That's not mm-hmm. everybody's story, nor should it be. But I think suffering 
is part of life. It's, you see suffering in your face in Uganda, suffering is in your face here. I think all of us know what it is to see a dream fade away or a plan that we had be laid aside. All of us experience loss and tragedy of some kind, and I just really wanted to write it to encourage people. No temptation to come back? to the United States? No. No? No. You wouldn't dream of bringing them back? No, no. Why? Uganda is our home. I really... Um, what is it about Uganda that... Because I, I have to tell you, I read about all the hardship and I'm amazed at what you've done there. No. I also, no. in some ways, couldn't imagine going down that path and particularly having lived in, look, luxury compared to the rest sure. of the world. Yeah. We are yeah. blessed. We are blessed. In a way that you don't appreciate until you experience some of the rest that of the world. That is very true. But having been on both sides of that, why wouldn't you want to come back and bring your children back to the plenty that is America? Yeah, I feel like God has work for us there. And I think there is something very satisfying and very joyful about knowing that you're doing what God has asked you to do. And I can't really, I can't really imagine trading that for mm. just to be somewhere a little more comfortable. And mm -hmm. I also, I really value raising our children up in their culture. Um, we. We are now a, a family of blended culture, but we get to experience their culture in a very rich way, which I think mm -hmm. is important for them. No, I love that. What I loved about the book is your openness to go where God calls you and stay there. Mm, and that's you. a hard thing to, that's a hard thing to do. It's easy to say, hard to do. Yeah. And I love that you're doing it and showing others how to do the same. Well, Thank thanks. you for being here. Daring to Hope, Finding God in the Broken and the Beautiful by Katie Davis Majors is available at bookstores everywhere and online.